Yeah, well, yeah, just a minute. Carolyn, I gotta run now. I I'll call you back later. For the best performance by a child actor or actress during the year 1949. And so dear to my heart, enchanted moviegoers and critics alike, Bobby Driscoll. Let's take a trip down memory lane to the golden era of television in the 90s, 50s. Remember those heartwarming TV shows like Father Knows Best and classic films like Old Yeller? Mom, let's get that dirty old dog out of our drinking water. Oh, mind your own business. They not only entertained us, but also introduced us to some incredibly talented child actors. But have you ever wondered what happened to those young stars as they grew up? Let's delve into their stories and catch up with where life has taken them since their days in the spotlight. Get ready for some surprising twists and turns as we uncover the fascinating journeys of these former child stars. Tommy Kirk. Tommy Kirk known for his roles in beloved Disney classics like Old Yeller and The Shaggy Dog, lived a life marked by fame, struggle, and eventual redemption. His journey through the highs and lows of Hollywood mirrors the roller coaster ride of his career. From his early days stumbling into showbiz at the Pasadena Playhouse at just 12 years old to becoming a household name as Joe Hardy in the Hardy Boys serial on The Mickey Mouse Club, Tommy's ascent seemed unstoppable. His talent shone brightly, captivating audiences with his charm and innocence. But fame has its pitfalls, and for Tommy, it came crashing down when his homosexuality became public knowledge. In an era when being gay was a career liability, Tommy faced immense pressure and scrutiny. Coupled with his struggles with substance abuse, his career took a nosedive, leaving him grappling with personal demons. Despite the setbacks, his legacy endures through his unforgettable portrayal of Travis in Old Yeller. The poignant tale of love and loss resonated with audiences, etching Tommy's name into the annals of cinematic history. His genuine tears and the heartbreaking climax spoke volumes, transcending the screen to touch the hearts of millions. In the wake of his Disney success, Tommy faced mounting challenges. His contract was not renewed after a public scandal involving his personal life, compounded by his battles with drugs and alcohol. The once promising star found himself on a downward spiral, struggling to reclaim the glory days of his youth. Yet, amidst the darkness, he found a glimmer of hope. Embracing Christianity, he embarked on a journey of self-discovery and redemption. Shedding his past struggles, he forged a new path, leaving behind the trappings of Hollywood for a simpler life. Tommy's resilience and faith guided him through the tumultuous years that followed. He reinvented himself as a businessman, finding success in unexpected places. Though his Hollywood days were behind him, his spirit remained unbroken, a testament to the power of redemption. In 2006, Disney bestowed upon Tommy the title of Disney legend, recognizing his contributions to the magic of Disney despite the obstacles he faced. It was a fitting tribute to a man who had weathered the storms of fame and emerged stronger on the other side. Born in Kentucky, his journey began amidst the backdrop of World War II. His family's move to California set the stage for his remarkable rise to stardom. Despite the challenges he faced, Tommy held on to fond memories of Walt Disney, who saw something special in him from the very beginning. In his later years, Tommy found solace in friendship. His bond with Beverly Washburn, his co-star from Old Yeller, transcended the passage of time. Together, they navigated the ups and downs of life, finding strength in each other's presence. Tommy's story is one of resilience, redemption, and the enduring power of the human spirit. Though he may have stumbled along the way, his legacy lives on in the hearts of those who knew him. As we remember Tommy Kirk, we celebrate not only his on-screen achievements, but also the indomitable spirit that defined his life. Ron Howard. Ron Howard, born in Duncan, Oklahoma on March 1, 1954, started his journey in showbiz at the tender age of 18 months. His parents, deeply entrenched in the entertainment industry, gave him his first shot at stardom with a screen debut in Frontier Woman. From there, Ron's path was set, and by age two, he was already gracing the stage in a production of The Seven Year Itch. As Ronnie Howard, he quickly became a familiar face on television, appearing in popular series such as Playhouse 90. Uh, and now online, you can actually follow the car you want to follow, uh, but the TV coverage. General Electric Theater, The Danny Thomas Show, The Fugitive, and Dr. Kildare. His versatility shone as he effortlessly transitioned between the small and big screens, making notable appearances in films like The Journey in 1959. But it was in 1960s that Ron truly made his mark, stepping into the shoes of one of his most beloved characters, Opie Taylor, on The Andy Griffith Show. This iconic role transformed him into the hearts of audiences across America and set the stage for a remarkable career ahead. Throughout the show's eight-year run, 
Are there rules for how Pa should treat his son if he's a kid? Ron's portrayal of Opie endeared him to viewers and solidified his status as a rising star. Even as a child actor, Ron harbored aspirations beyond performing. Fueling his passion for filmmaking, he enrolled in the University of Southern California's esteemed film program after completing high school. It was here that he honed his skills and laid the groundwork for what would become a prolific directing career. In 1977, the your parents. And he took his first leap into the director's chair with Grand Theft Auto, marking the beginning of a new chapter in his professional journey. The film's success paved the way for a string of comedic hits, including Night Shift in 1982, Splash in 1984, and Parenthood in 1989. Each project showcased Ron's innate ability to blend humor with heart, captivating audiences and critics alike. But Ron's directorial prowess wasn't limited to comedy. In 1995, he tackled the harrowing true story of Apollo 13. He's in music. Yes. Uh, you don't sing, though, do you? <laughs> delivering a gripping depiction of the ill-fated space mission. The film garnered widespread acclaim, solidifying Ron's reputation as a versatile filmmaker capable of handling both lighthearted fare and weighty dramas. In 2001, he achieved a career milestone with A Beautiful Mind, a poignant biopic chronicling the life of mathematician John Nash. So, um, my sort of pitch back to the film struck a chord with audiences and critics alike, earning Ron an Academy Award for Best Director and cementing his status as a Hollywood heavyweight. From there, Ron continued to push boundaries, helming projects across genres with finesse and flair. From the gritty boxing drama Cinderella Man in 2005 to the high-octane thriller The Da Vinci Code in 2006, he proved time and again that he was a force to be reckoned with in the world of cinema. In addition to his work in narrative filmmaking, Potsy, I feel like I'm going to a benefit for Elsie the cow. Ron also delved into the world of documentary filmmaking, exploring diverse subjects ranging from music festivals to culinary adventures. His commitment to storytelling knew no bounds, and each project served as a testament to his boundless creativity and passion for the craft. In 1986, Ron co-founded Imagine Entertainment alongside Brian Grazer, further solidifying his impact on the industry. Together, they produced a slew of acclaimed television shows, including 24, Friday Night Lights, and Arrested Development, showcasing Ron's versatility as a producer. But perhaps Ron's greatest achievement lies in his ability to inspire and entertain audiences around the world. From his early days as a child actor to his current status as a revered director and producer, he has left an indelible mark on the world of entertainment. Today, at 68 years old, Ron shows no signs of slowing down. His latest project, Hillbilly Elegy, continues to captivate audiences with its raw emotion and powerful performances. With each new endeavor, Ron reaffirms his status as a true Hollywood legend, leaving an enduring legacy that will inspire generations to come. Bobby Driscoll. In March of 1968, a pair of children playing in an abandoned tenement in New York City's Greenwich Village stumbled upon a grim discovery. A young man's lifeless body lying on a cot, surrounded by empty beer bottles and religious pamphlets. It wasn't the ending you'd expect from a Disney fairy tale, but more akin to the somber conclusions found in paperback mysteries. This young man had no identification, and there were no obvious signs of foul play. His identity remained a mystery, and no family came forward to claim him. And with one leg among them, Long John Silver. Authorities, unable to locate his next of kin, declared him dead from the effects of long-term heroin use and laid him to rest in an unmarked grave on Hart Island, alongside other forgotten souls who had fallen on hard times. This anonymous grave also became the final resting place of Peter Pan, not the fictional character, but Bobby Driscoll, a former child star who once graced the silver screen with his roles in Disney classics like Song of the South, and Peter Pan. Driscoll's journey from Hollywood fame to obscurity Cut, Captain. I promise Dr. Lizzie. was a far cry from the enchanted adventures he portrayed on screen. Discovered at the age of five by a barber who saw potential in him, Driscoll quickly rose to fame with roles that showcased his pert nose and freckled face. However, his innocence soon gave way to the harsh realities of adulthood. When Disney severed ties with him in 1953, Driscoll struggled to find his place in the world, battling loneliness and addiction. Despite fleeting attempts to rebuild his life, Please, Captain Bones, Doctor said it'd kill you. 
Driscoll's path veered into darkness. He found himself entangled in a web of drug use and legal troubles, leading to multiple arrests and a stint in prison. His once promising future dimmed as he drifted through life, ultimately meeting a tragic end in an abandoned New York City apartment, far from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. Decades later, Driscoll's story continues to captivate and haunt those who remember him. Efforts to preserve his memory, from documentaries to tributes, serve as reminders of the fragility of fame. Oh, that's what those scoundrels wanted, the map of Flint's treasure island. And the toll it can take on even the brightest stars. While Driscoll's Walk of Fame star may go unnoticed by many, his legacy lives on in the hearts of those who knew him and the fans who cherish his work. As we reflect on his life, let us not dwell on his shortcomings, but instead celebrate his achievements and honor the lost boy who left an indelible mark on cinematic history. In death, he found an unlikely sanctuary on Heart Island, where the echoes of his troubled past fade into the tranquil surroundings. Though his exact resting place remains unknown, efforts to uncover the truth symbolize a quest for closure and remembrance. Lauren Chapin. Lauren Chapin became a household name thanks to her role as Kathy in the iconic TV show Father Knows Best. Winning five children's Emmy Awards and appearing in nearly every episode, Don't you worry, Fluffy. This magic stuff won't hurt a bit. She was the darling of the small screen. At just 77 years old today, Lauren's story isn't just about fame and fortune. For many child actors like her, life takes unexpected turns. Some miss out on school, while others struggle in the cutthroat world of showbiz. Unfortunately, Chapin found herself in the latter category. Rising to stardom before her 10th birthday, she seemed to have it all. But the spotlight brought its own set of challenges, nearly derailing her young life. Born in Los Angeles in 1945, Lauren's journey to fame began at the age of nine when she landed the role of Kathy. Auditioning among a crowd of hopefuls, she clinched the part, much to her mother's relief. If all the kids had a mommy like you, nobody would ever be bad, except when they weren't good. But success wasn't guaranteed. Her screen test was the last one held, leaving her fate hanging by a thread. Thankfully, when she walked in, it was an instant match. She was Kathy. Father Knows Best became a sensation of the 1950s, capturing hearts with its wholesome family tales. Despite criticism for portraying an idealized family, for Lauren, it was all about fun. Growing up on set meant rubbing shoulders with Hollywood royalty and witnessing movie magic firsthand. But fame had its downsides. She felt trapped, pressured to be Kathy even when the cameras stopped rolling. When the show ended, so did Lauren's stability. Unable to shake off the Kathy label, she struggled to find work. By 16, she was married and out of high school, her life careening off course. Hanging out with the wrong crowd and battling mental health issues, she hit rock bottom. Yet, from the depths of despair, Lauren found redemption. Embracing her faith, she became an ordained evangelist, sharing her story of survival and renewal. Her journey wasn't easy, marked by stints in jail, rehab, and mental institutions, but she emerged stronger, a testament to the power of resilience. Today, Lauren is a mother of two. Well fortified for a famine. Do you and Betty read the same dictionary, Daddy? Her past struggles a distant memory. Though some still view her through the lens of her former fame, she's found peace in spreading love and hope. Despite the challenges, she's amassed a modest fortune. But her true wealth lies in her newfound purpose. Lauren embodies the spirit of transformation with each sermon she delivers and each word she writes. Her life may not have followed a fairy tale script, but she's authoring her own narrative of triumph over adversity. And in a world often devoid of kindness, she's on a mission to restore the values of love and family. George Winslow. Meet George Winslow, the child star with a husky voice and a straight face act, who stole the spotlight alongside Marilyn Monroe in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. His journey began in Hollywood's biggest movies. The first reason is I'm too young to be sent to jail. The second reason is... Not on TV like most kids. At just eight, he wowed audiences with Cary Grant and dropped a slick line on Monroe herself. But fame wasn't his thing. By 12, he waved goodbye to showbiz and later served in the Navy during Vietnam, then spent years in the U.S. Postal Service until his passing in 2015. Remember those child stars from the 50s? George Winslow was one of them. From his iconic roles with Grant to his memorable encounter with Monroe, he left a mark on Hollywood. But his real-life story was just as intriguing. Born George Wenslaff, he caught Grant's eye thanks to his radio show appearances, landing him roles in big films. 
Even though he wasn't keen on acting, he still made a lasting impression. With 10 films under his belt, Winslow wasn't just a child star, he was a force to be reckoned with. From Room for One More to The Rocket Man, he showcased his talent alongside Hollywood legends. Somebody will stop us the minute we light a fire, they always do. Yeah, that's right. And who can forget that shipboard scene with Monroe in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes? Winslow's deadpan delivery stole the show, proving age is just a number in the world of entertainment. But fame wasn't everything to Winslow. After his brief stint in the spotlight, he chose a quieter life, serving his country and later working in the Postal Service. Despite his on-screen success, he remained humble and grounded, never seeking the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. Even though he retired from showbiz at a young age, Winslow's legacy lives on. His iconic roles and memorable performances continue to inspire generations. I love to appreciate a good-looking girl when I see one. This promises to be quite a trip. And while he may have left the limelight behind, his impact on cinema is everlasting. So here's to George Winslow, the child star who took Hollywood by storm with his raspy voice and deadpan charm. Though he may be gone, his talent and legacy will never be forgotten. Cheers to the boy who dared to be different in a world of glitz and glamour. Richard Keith Streaming services and retro channels are a treasure trove for baby boomers, offering a nostalgic trip down memory lane with beloved television programs from yesteryears. It's like stepping back in time to relive those cherished moments spent in front of the TV. Whether it's the antics of Lucy Ricardo or the small town charm of Mayberry. What is this, Abuela? Very good, very good. What are you going to say, Mommy? These shows hold a special place in the hearts of many. One such iconic figure from the golden age of television is Keith Thibodeau, better known by his stage name Richard Keith. He made his mark as a child actor on two of the most beloved sitcoms of all time, I Love Lucy and The Andy Griffith Show. And all of Ricky's family, and guess what, Carolyn? I learned how to do the cha-cha-cha. His journey from a precocious youngster to a multifaceted artist is nothing short of remarkable. A young Keith Thibodeau, just five years old, walks into the audition room for I Love Lucy. Lucille Ball, the queen of comedy herself, looks at him and asks, Okay, he's cute, but what does he do? Without missing a beat, Keith strolls over to a nearby drum set and starts laying down a rhythm that impresses everyone in the room. And just like that, he lands the role of Little Ricky, becoming one of the biggest child stars of the 1950s. But Keith's talents didn't stop there. Throughout the 60s, he continued to captivate audiences with his portrayal of Opie's best friend on The Andy Griffith Show. His character, Johnny Paul Johnson, brought warmth and camaraderie to the small screen, endearing him to fans everywhere. Despite his success in Hollywood, Keith's true passion plays elsewhere. After high school, he pivoted back to his first love, drumming. He joined the rock band David and the Giants, embarking on a musical journey that would span decades. His drumming skills, which he began honing at the tender age of three, became his ticket to stardom and paved the way for a successful music career. But Keith's story doesn't end there. In 1990, he took on a new role as the executive director of his wife's ballet company, Ballet Magnificent. His love for the arts extended beyond acting and music, showcasing his versatility as an artist. Born into a Catholic family, Keith's upbringing instilled in him a strong sense of faith and values. He attended schools in Hollywood before his parents' separation led him to Notre Dame High School in Sherman Oaks. It was there that he began to discover his passion for the performing arts, setting him on a path that would ultimately lead to stardom. In 1976, Keith married Kathy Denton, a ballet dancer whom he met while touring with his band. Their shared love for dance led them to establish Ballet Magnificent, a renowned ballet company with branches in the United States and Brazil. Together, they have nurtured the talents of countless dancers and brought the beauty of ballet to audiences around the world. Today, Keith's legacy lives on through his work in both the entertainment and arts industries. Whether he's drumming on stage or directing a ballet performance, his passion for the arts shines through in everything he does. And for fans looking to revisit the golden era of television, streaming services and retro channels offer the perfect opportunity to relive those classic moments from I Love Lucy and The Andy Griffith Show. So, the next time you find yourself scrolling through your streaming options, why not take a trip down memory lane with Keith Thibodeau? From his early days as Little Ricky, to his current role as a respected musician and art director, his story is a testament to the enduring power of talent and passion. Johnny Crawford 
Johnny Crawford, a beloved face on TV screens, passed away in April at 75. Known for his role as Chuck Connors' son in The Rifleman and later for his musical success, Crawford's journey was remarkable. Starting young, Crawford appeared on The Mickey Mouse Club at just nine years old. Despite an early setback, being cut from the show, he bounced back, landing roles in series like The Lone Ranger, before making his mark on The Rifleman. His on-screen chemistry with Connors was matched by their off-screen bond. At 13, Crawford earned an Emmy nomination, showcasing his talent at a tender age. But his talents weren't confined to acting. He had a passion for music, too. Signing with Delphi Records, he churned out top 40 hits, including Cindy's Birthday, which climbed to number 8 on the Billboard charts. Even amidst his TV stardom, Crawford found time for his other passion, rodeo. Competing in events like calf roping and bull riding, he embodied the spirit of a true cowboy. Later, he transitioned to music of a different era, leading the Johnny Crawford Dance Orchestra, delighting audiences with tunes from the 1920s and 30s. His love for music wasn't just a hobby, it was a lifelong pursuit. From performing with Vince Giordano's orchestra in New York to starting his own group in Los Angeles, Crawford's musical journey was as varied as it was fulfilling. Beyond his professional achievements, Crawford cherished his personal life. Married to Charlotte McKenna, his high school sweetheart, he found joy in family and friends. His legacy lives on through his wife, stepdaughters, and siblings. Reflecting on his varied career, he found solace in his music. Leading his orchestra, he found fulfillment akin to performing Shakespeare. And in a fitting twist, he paid himself better than any other producer, a testament to his enduring passion and talent. In life and in death, Johnny Crawford remains an icon, a reminder of the power of talent, resilience, and the pursuit of one's passions. Though he may have left this world, his legacy lives on in the hearts of fans, forever immortalized in the annals of entertainment history. Angela Cartwright Angela Cartwright, once a teenage sensation, captured the hearts of millions as Penny in Lost in Space. Battling aliens and facing off against Dr. Smith, she embodied bravery, mirroring her on-screen persona. Off the set, she balanced schoolwork with her passion for art, eagerly anticipating Fridays for her artistic endeavors. Artistry ran in Cartwright's bloodline. Her father, a skilled artist and vocalist, relocated the family from England to California in pursuit of new opportunities. A chance encounter with a neighbor opened the doors to show business for Angela, setting her on a trajectory of success spanning iconic shows like The Danny Thomas Show and timeless classics like The Sound of Music. Despite her early achievements, Cartwright's journey was one of continuous evolution. Transitioning to photography, she found a new outlet for her creativity. Experimenting with mixed media, she explored diverse artistic expressions, laying the groundwork for her innovative art wear collection. Her art wear transcends mere clothing, morphing into wearable masterpieces. Each piece is meticulously crafted, reflecting Cartwright's unwavering commitment to quality and aesthetic excellence. From tops to accessories, her creations serve as a testament to her boundless ingenuity. Yet Cartwright's artistic vision extends beyond the realm of fashion, drawing inspiration from the sound of music. She seamlessly integrates scenes from the beloved film into her artwork. Her deep connection to the movie resonates, mirroring her enduring bond with her on-screen siblings. In addition to her creative pursuits, Cartwright is a devoted wife and mother. Transforming her children's rooms into personal workspaces, she continues to nurture her artistic spirit. Overcoming her initial apprehensions, stemming from her father's formidable talent, she embraces her unique style as an unruly artist. A staunch advocate for arts education, Cartwright believes in unlocking the creative potential within every individual. She laments the diminishing presence of creative outlets in school curricula, fearing a future devoid of artistic expression and free thought. Balancing the demands of the art business with her creative integrity is a constant juggling act for Cartwright. Yet inspiration permeates her surroundings, from arranging flowers to delving into archival treasures for her forthcoming book project. Approaching nearly five decades in the industry, Cartwright remains grounded, finding joy in life's simple pleasures. With a pragmatic yet passionate approach to her craft, she continues to inspire generations with her timeless artistry, leaving an indelible mark on the world of creativity. Catherine Beaumont Catherine's journey began on a sunny day in London, June 27, 1938. 
Born into a family deeply rooted in entertainment, her childhood was painted with the vibrant colors of showbiz. Her mom dazzled audiences as a professional dancer, while her dad strummed the strings of musical instruments. At just five years old, Catherine was plucked from the crowd and landed her first gig in the film It Happened One Sunday in 1944. MGM, the giant of Hollywood, soon noticed her talent and whisked her away to the United States. In Tinseltown, Catherine's star continued to rise with roles in movies like On an Island with You, The Secret Garden, and Challenge to Lassie. But these were small, uncredited parts. Catherine yearned for her big break, yet fate seemed determined to test her resolve. Her co-star in The Secret Garden, Margaret O'Brien, was hogging the limelight, threatening to eclipse Catherine's burgeoning career. When the curtains closed on Challenge to Lassie, both Catherine and Margaret found themselves jobless. MGM severed ties with them, responding to Margaret's mother's demands for a higher paycheck. Everyone's here now. How about that surprise you promised? Okay, Kathy. However, Catherine had etched her name in Hollywood's annals as a promising child star, making her transition to Disney inevitable. Walt Disney, the visionary behind countless childhood dreams, was on the lookout for a young voice to embody Alice in his adaptation of Lewis Carroll's classic tale. Her heavy British accent and contractual disputes led Disney to pivot swiftly. In a whirlwind of events, Catherine stepped into the role just four days after the announcement, solidifying her place in Disney's illustrious history. Alice in Wonderland marked a significant milestone in Catherine's career. Voicing Alice and serving as a live-action reference model for animators, she breathed life into the whimsical character. The film's release in 1951 captivated audiences, propelling Catherine into the spotlight. Her promotional tour and appearances on Disney's television special endeared her to fans worldwide. Disney's faith in Catherine remained unwavering as they entrusted her with the role of Wendy Darling in Peter Pan. Once again, If I were a rabbit, where would I keep my gloves? She lent her voice and physical presence to another beloved character, leaving an indelible mark on the hearts of audiences. But as the final curtain fell on her acting career, Catherine's journey took a different path. She pursued her studies, attending public high school and later the University of Southern California. A career in teaching beckoned, and Catherine dedicated three decades to shaping young minds in elementary schools. In 1983, Disney beckoned once more, offering Catherine the opportunity to reprise her roles as Alice and Wendy. Though her acting days were behind her, her association with Disney endured, enriching the lives of new generations through her timeless characters. Now, at 82 years old, Catherine fondly reminisces about her time with Disney, cherishing the memories of her iconic roles. Despite the passage of time, her passion for storytelling and the magic of Disney remains undiminished. Playing Alice in Walt Disney's Alice in Wonderland was one of the highlights of my career and my life. Catherine Beaumont, Jerry Mathers, Jerry Mathers, Jerry Mathers, forever etched in memory as Theodore Beaver Cleaver, captured hearts during his six-year stint on Leave it to Beaver. At just 14, Mathers traded the small screen for high school hallways, seamlessly transitioning from child actor to teenager. Despite his fame, Mathers remained grounded, navigating the complexities of adolescence like any other kid. He joined the high school football team, embracing the camaraderie of sports and forging friendships that anchored him in reality. A pivotal moment came on the gridiron when Mathers faced off against John Vela, a freshman powerhouse who redirected his football aspirations. Undeterred, Mathers sought a new path, enlisting in the Air Force for six years. Yet a sense of incompleteness lingered. Driven by a thirst for knowledge, Mathers pursued philosophy at the University of California, Berkeley, and tapped into his intellectual curiosity. During his academic pursuits, Mathers stumbled into the world of investments, finding himself drawn to the intricacies of finance. His tenure at a Berkeley bank exposed him to the nuances of real estate, sparking a new venture. Venturing into entrepreneurship, Mathers ventured into real estate and even ventured into pawnbroking, demonstrating a knack for diversification and adaptation. Despite his ventures outside of acting, the allure of the stage never waned. Mathers made a comeback, gracing screens once more with appearances on The Love Boat and the revival of Leave It to Beaver. Despite his enduring fame, Mathers shunned the spotlight, finding solace in a life of simplicity. For Jerry Mathers, happiness lay not in the glare of Hollywood, but in the quiet moments of ordinary life. We hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you in the next one.